Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I want to share this thing with you just before we start, if it's going to work. It's off Facebook, so it must be true, hey? It's from a man of God that some of you would have heard of. Who's heard of an Australian pastor called Steve Penny? Heard of Steve Penny? Some of us have. Steve's a great man, used to pastor up on the Sunshine Coast near where we were. And Steve shares a little bit about this week, the results of the census came out. And uh, in typical fashion, they didn't really report it accurately, is my assumption. Okay, well, you probably should take that up with Dad. So, don't talk to Dad. So, a lot of people have been writing about the census this week and saying Christianity in Australia is on a steep decline. It won't be long before it's dead. But they failed to actually talk about the amount of immigrants and other different bits and pieces that actually fit this puzzle. But, puzzle. but Steve Penny shared this and it really challenged me. He said this, he wrote this yesterday and he entitled it The Decline of the Church says this, following the latest census report in August 2021, Australians have once again been advised that Christianity is a decreasing sector of our society. Baby boomers who were the post-war children of the 50s grew up with parents who had a strong faith in God and their values based on their Christian faith. Thus, our statistics showed a strong presence of Christian faith and values at this time. Baby boomers are now old and dying, and their values are ignored as being irrelevant to an enlightened, self-focused generation. Any baby boomers here today? Aren't you glad you came to church? Millennials. The latest statistics reveal that millennials now outnumber baby boomers, and thus their influences are now plainly seen in our society. Millennials are the children of a society bent on three things. Listen to this. Materialism, pleasure, and self-worth. These three values have been ensconced in the children of this privileged and entitled generation. So now we have the millennial church. And Steve says, sadly the church, not every church, but some churches have evolved to stay attractive to this new demanding demographic and has embraced a gospel that preaches the above three deceptive values. We love to preach about materialism and call it prosperity. We love to preach about pleasure and say God wants you to feel good. Or we love to preach about self-worth and say you first. Interesting. Steve said now is the time for the Australian church to repent and return. There can never be a real revival based on the present truth being preached. Returning to God in humility and repentance, repentance, and re-surrendering to his will and purpose. This is the only hope for the human soul. Any church not preaching repentance is a woke church. Isn't that interesting? And he just finishes by saying it's time to stay enough. The comments are in the hundreds. It's been shared hundreds of times. It's obviously resounding. People are starting to say that's, that's true. What Steve says is true. And the reason that I thought about that just in that moment is because we still hear of churches today who've removed communion from their, from their service, from this part here, because we don't like to make people feel uncomfortable or awkward when they come to church. We want them to feel good. We want them to sit in a warm building, which it wasn't warm this morning, was it, Marlene? We were a bit frozen, so we had a bit of a wake-up call. We want to give them a nice hot coffee so they feel good. We don't actually talk about tithing anymore. I don't know if you've noticed this. Some churches don't talk about tithing. They talk about giving and and our money goes to feed the homeless because that's attractive. Or we make these beautiful food hampers and all of a sudden churches go from actually teaching on tithing and sowing into God's kingdom as his word instructs us and we've watered it down to would you just give and help us with our charities? Can you see what's happened in the church today? This is not the church I grew up in. I didn't grow up in a church like that. And I refuse to let this church go down a path where we don't follow what the Bible says. 
And so this is why we're continuing on this message about counterfeit spiritual practices. Now we've talked about a couple of these, but we do need to talk about more. And today we're talking about one that may surprise you. Three voices in my head. So today we're talking about should Christians use crystals? Now, some of you are probably saying, I don't even know why we're talking about this. Isn't this a bit obvious? And others are probably saying, oh, well, she obviously is going to say that it's all right for Christians to use crystals. But let's talk a bit about it this morning because it depends on who you read and what they say. You might actually hear differing opinions if you rely on Google alone. But that's the best thing about being a Christian, isn't it? We actually have the Bible. So we can read the Bible And we can get our own revelation on these things. The truth is a lot of people are fascinated with crystals. They seem to be everywhere at the moment. They're not just in those hippie shops. You can find them in mainstream stores. And they are bright and they're colourful. And who doesn't like shiny things? They're all over social media. And if you were blinded to some of the, I guess, principles that keep Christians walking on the straight and narrow, you might actually think to yourself... Well, there's no harm in them. They're just pretty rocks, aren't they? Some of us even think it's okay to bring them into our homes. Many regard crystals to be able to possess mystical power that can be utilised for healing purposes. I'll never forget when I was a child, my mum taking one of my brothers to a church where he saw somebody... I need to ask mum the part of that story. And I remember seeing my brother lying on a table and they put crystals all over his back. And I remember as a child thinking, yuck. That's my first thought was, yuck. What is that? I also clearly remember never going back there again and wondering why as an adult mum never explained it to us. Maybe she didn't understand, but I know that mum thought at the time herself, no, this is not what we came for. Very interesting that you see it in churches. So people do feel that crystals have healing power. Some believe that crystals can also stimulate spiritual growth and bring about a positive transformation in life experience. So is it okay to be actively involved in crystal healing? And should we be relying on crystals for power? What counsel does the Bible give? with regards to this question. Because generally as Christians, the first thing we should do is to study the word and say, well, what does the Bible say about this? And part of the problem that the Christian church has today, this entitled generation that fills millennial churches, is we don't read the Bible. We read what we want to read in the Bible. So we go searching for scriptures that make me feel good because, you know, the Bible says, he will give me the desires of my heart. And they're the scriptures we like. But we forget about the scriptures that talk about, woe is he that does this. And they're the scriptures we're going to have a look at this morning. So what does the Bible say? I can't wait to share these things with you this morning. Lately, we've been talking about Satan's counterfeit methodology where God plants the wheat and he plants the tear. And the problem is that when the wheat and the tear go in together, it doesn't look too dissimilar. We only start to see the difference as the plant has taken hold and started to grow and now has a root system, making it a lot harder to remove. I'm not a gardener by any means, but I do like to pick out weeds that come straight out. I don't like the weeds that you have to have a fight with to get out of the ground. And some of us are willingly planting these spiritual weeds in our life. Why don't we open in prayer this morning and then we'll dive in together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. God, we thank you for your son Jesus, the incredible sacrifice he made with his life for us. God, we thank you that you gave us the Bible, the word of God that is our guidebook for life. 
Lord, we thank you that every answer to our problems is in there. And we pray, Lord, this morning as we open the word together today that you would bring those answers out to us. God, that it would be like scriptures jumping out of the page, that we would have a revelation from you, God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you're here by your Holy Spirit this morning, leading and guiding, bringing correction if needed. We thank you, Jesus. We receive from you now, Lord, with open hearts and open ears. Everyone who agrees said? Amen. Amen. So I guess the first part to ask ourselves, if you were a teacher, the first thing you'd probably want to talk to your students about is, so, well, what is a crystal? And talking about crystals, what is a crystal? Crystals are solid materials formed from minerals. I think we all know what they are. Is there anybody that doesn't know what crystals are? Crystals and gemstones are different, by the way. I didn't have time to go into that this morning. Talking about crystals today. The minerals in crystals are specifically arranged into a specific order to form a certain structure. That's how you get the beautiful shapes, the lights that come through them, and that sort of thing. Crystals also have a specific formula needed for certain ions. Each type of ion formula creates a certain type of crystal. Crystals are often used as pretty decorations in homes. They're bright. They come in all sorts of different shapes, sizes and colours. And it makes them incredibly appealing. Crystals here in Australia have grown in intense popularity in the last five years. And as I'm sharing with you this morning, I'd love you to ask the question of yourself, why has a rock grown in such popularity in Australia in the last five years? Why are people turning to a rock? Just let that one marinate in your head for a little while. They're all over social media. They look beautiful. They're highly marketed towards 16 to 20-year-olds because they're aesthetically appealing. Though some people use crystals simply for decoration or to fit in, many also believe that crystals have a specific use. They actually believe there's power in them. Crystals certainly are beautiful objects, and the truth is they were created by God. So then you'll have people say to you, well, there's obviously no problem with them, is there? If God created them, there's nothing wrong with crystals. But we do need to go on and look at what happens when you plant a tear beside wheat. Portions of God's glorious heavenly city in the New Jerusalem will be constructed from crystals. The Bible says to us in Revelation 21 verse 11, It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a precious jewel, like a jasper. Clear as crystal. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third was chalcedony, if that's how you say it. The fourth was emerald, the fifth was sardonyx, the sixth was carnelian, the seventh was chrysolite, the eighth was beryl, the ninth was topanx. Topaz. The tenth was Chrysophrase, if that's it. The eleventh was Jacinth, and the twelfth was Amethyst. So crystals are in the Bible. Now you might sort of wonder, it's not that hard to understand why people are confused. When evaluating the appropriate use of crystals and should they be used for healing purposes, It's important to be aware of the fact that the majority of experts who promote crystal healing are involved in the occult. Whether openly or not, the word occult means hidden. Occultism concerns itself with the study and utilisation of supernatural influences, powers and phenomena that are normally hidden from the regular physical senses and are generally considered to be outside the realm of traditional scientific observation. And sometimes people also believe that they're trans-dimensional, so a, a, a crystal can travel back into your past or it can travel into your future at the same time where you are, and it starts to get a little bit trippy. Occultists believe that human beings in this world are permeated by invisible, mystical energies. 
And I do want to cover in the coming weeks talking about chakras and things like that because it's very easy to get confused because the Bible does talk about some things that you could confuse with these things if you weren't reading the Bible correctly. So it's interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about the other ways. So crystals can sometimes be used in connection to astrology, numerology, divination, tarot cards, psychic healing, medianship, spirit channeling, Eastern religions, ritual magic, and sorcery. So when you start healing that, you're hearing that, we might start thinking to ourselves, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Let's read on. What does God say about our involvement with the occult? The Bible, the Bible tells us that. The answers are actually in the Bible. We can find it for ourselves. God warned the Israelites against it when they were about to enter the promised land of Canaan. It's actually in the Bible. Deuteronomy 18 verses 9 to 12 says, When you enter the land your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in wishcraft or casts spells, or who has a medium or a spiritist or who contains or consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be detestable to the Lord. And so I read these things and I say, okay, God, what is it about their behavior that's detestable to you? Because I don't want to do that. I want to be the opposite of that. I want to be pleasing to God. Crystals in the early generations gave people a false sense of power and safety. They used to wear these things on their wrist called amulet. I think the right word is amulets around their wrist or their neck. And it was basically a crystal sewn into fabric or leather that they wore protection. It was to wear, to wear for protection. I beg your pardon. It was to ward off evil spirits. It was to provide healing power if they were away. Now, none of that sounds like something a Christian should be involved in. Crystals are believed by many to attribute healing powers. They're considered to be mystical and they're granted these powers through the earth. In fact, and this is not a joke, some people will say if you rub crystals in your hands a certain amount of times, it's specific, you hold them a certain way, and you put them under the full moon to charge, and you store them in your house in the right place, and then you rub them a certain number of times, it will satisfy your need. I don't know if you've read the Bible lately, but it says, my God will supply all my needs. I don't need to be walking around picking up rocks, rubbing rocks, charging rocks under a full moon. None of that is for Christians. And we have to begin to understand how churches who've gone down a path of millennialism, are opening themselves up to this because they don't preach truth. They don't preach repentance. Now, I can tell you, and if Rachel was here today, she would tell you as well, on my business Instagram page, I did a post about this. I talked about the dangers of some of these things And luckily I had on the armour of God because, boy, did it come back at me. And I'm sitting there. I didn't laugh because that's very disrespectful. But I read these comments and thought to myself, whoa, some people really are deceived. They really are. And I remember having said to Rachel and Tracy, look, I don't do these things lightly. I really feel that God is calling me to expose these things, to preach about these things and to come from a place of truth and say, Christians, this is not for you. And the funny thing is, everybody who commented in a negative way was what I would say was not a Christian. I've never heard them say they were. But the commentary coming out of their mouth was bizarre. It was really bizarre. And I wrote back to each and every one of them and I said, you may have missed the the top part, the very introduction. You might have skimmed over that. Uh, This was for Christians. I was just directing this teaching to Christians. Well, you have no right to say that. Wow. And I said, sorry that you feel that way, but I wasn't actually having a personal attack at you. I was just sharing the truth 
about the Word of God. And I also had a number of Christians who I know personally, have met them face to face, would even call them friends, actually say, whoa, I did not know that. My own sister said to me, I'm so glad somebody is starting to talk about this because we don't hear about it in church. How are we supposed to know what we can and can't do? How are we supposed to know what's right? How are we supposed to know this if people are not teaching us? And could you imagine, so my boys are two, four, and six, basically. Could you imagine when they are each 18 years of age, if they said to us, I I just saw this thing, or I read about this thing, I was at this church, and, and they took communion, like, what is that? Could you imagine kids growing up in a church not being exposed to what communion is? Like to me, why have a church if you're taking the power of God out of the church? It's a community group with no power. And I, I'll be really careful what I say, I suppose, but it, it genuinely concerns me when I see churches around Australia of all denominations doing this, removing these central parts of what it means to gather as a Christian. Removing the things that make us who we are. None of us are good enough to be here. We're saved by grace. We're saved by what our Jesus did on the cross for us. But if you don't hear that at church on a Sunday, if you don't hear that God wants to heal you, if you don't hear about the healing power of God or testimonies, because some churches deem testimonies daggy, if you don't hear that in church, the next time you're scrolling on Instagram and somebody says, oh, I use this rock, this little rock, bought it at Kmart, and I haven't been sick, it's amazing. And you might think, wow, I might, I might give that a crack. Why not? You haven't heard at church it's a bad idea. You haven't even heard at church that anybody gets healed. So why wouldn't you be starting to draw yourself towards these things? Because they're attractive. One thing the enemy does really well is marketing. He's very good at marketing. Very good at advertising. And is very good at dragging Christians just one degree to the left. And so we sort of think, it's not... It's not bad, not killing anyone. It's not, I mean, I know that much about the Bible. I mean, it's, it's a rock. They're in the Bible. So it's, it's not bad. And that's how the enemy gets a foothold in our life because we open the door to him and we allow him to come in. So I want to keep talking a little bit more about crystals this morning so you understand the dangers. They're mystical They rely on the earth's power and they're actually advertised to bring you joy, to bring you mental clarity, to bring you better health, to bring you good luck, spiritual healing and to cleanse your aura. These are things that people want because it's all about me. That's what we've been taught. If you feel good, it's all about you. Put yourself first. It's all about self-care. And I'm a big advocate of self-care and taking care of yourself What I'm not an advocate for is selfish behavior. And as Christians, we should not be selfish. We should be focused on the King of Kings and realizing we are saved by grace. And our life is the Bible that people are reading. And how are we serving our community? How are we serving our God? Selfish people. I don't think selfishness belongs in the kingdom of God. So then we have Buddhism. Buddhists use crystals in their rituals and practices to welcome healing and to dissolve, to, to, sorry, to solve the issues they're facing. I told you before, for crystals to maintain their powers, they have to be kept a certain way. Sometimes in the past, crystals were added into the potions and recipes that witches would make, and they were removed before the potion was consumed. Crystals are a way of manipulating the spiritual realm. So we should be starting to gather a bit of a picture here of what is and isn't for Christians. The use of the word sacred stones for mystical purposes was common among the pagan people 
of the Bible lands. Called amulets, these magical charms were made in the form of small pendulums. Sorry, small pendants. I don't know what's wrong with my mouth this morning. I can hardly speak properly. Small pendants attached to a necklace or a bracelet. They were worn to protect a person from negative energies, evil and injury, and to bring good luck. God himself issued a stern warning. And we read about this in the Bible. God issued the warning to the false prophetesses of Israel who in their apostasy had adopted the pagan practice of wearing amulets. In Ezekiel 13 verse 18, it says this, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Woe to the women who sew magic charms on their wrists and make veils of various lengths for their heads in order to ensnare people. Will you ensnare the lives of my people but preserve your own? I am against your magic charms with which you ensnare people like birds and I will tear them from your arms, says God. I will set free the people that you ensnare like birds. I will tear off your veils and I will save my people from your hands and they will no longer fall prey to your power. I feel like when God said that, he was probably pretty passionate and pretty upset with these false prophetess. So the question then remains, can Christians use crystals for healing and protection? The use of crystals is unbiblical. Yes, God created them, but we don't read anywhere in the scripture where God says to use a rock for healing or to use a rock for protection. Crystals are believed to have healing properties and they're traditionally used by witches and they can become idols in your life. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 calls these works of the flesh and Christians need to reject witchcraft, including crystals. But then you might say, can Christians use crystals for decoration? I mean, they're pretty. We're not going to rub them together. We're not going to rely on them to meet our every need. And the truth is crystals are beautiful and they are a nice decoration. And you can put them on a shelf and just look at them. You can use them to brighten up a corner of your home. It all seems innocent, doesn't it, if we don't use them. But we have to be cautious of what they really are. They are a weapon used by the enemy to enter into our lives. Having crystals in our homes, whether we believe in their supposed powers or not, is not a wise idea. Having them in our home also welcomes in crystals' dark history into our lives. The enemy is powerful and a master of deception. He has the power to use something beautiful for evil. There is something that you need to seek your heavenly father about. If you have crystals in your home, to pray and say to God, should I be putting them in the bin? Should I be getting rid of these? And you might say, they're just decorations. They're just on the shelf. They're not, I don't even look at them really, God. Pray and ask God. Surrender yourself to what he says to you. This message alone should not be the only thing you do. We should be reading our Bibles ourselves, looking up these scriptures, listening to the replay, going through those scriptures and saying, okay, Jesus, let's study these scriptures together. What did you really mean by that? Because you may actually have other jewelry in your home that you shouldn't have. I'll never forget one day getting a mystery box of earrings and I can only describe it as Yuck. It's all I can describe it as. Open up my earrings. Oh, that's so nice. That's so nice. And I turned this other pair over and I thought, yuck. And I sent a photo of them to Pastor Sheena and I said, Sheena, just humor me. I said, why do these earrings make me feel yuck? And she said, well, it turns out you've got a good radar because the logo etched ever so subtly into those earrings is the fifth eye. It's demonic. They were demonic earrings that I nearly put on. I was going to walk around with them. We have to get really good at seeing what's out there, at actually looking and what are we consuming? What are we buying? One of my good friends in Horsham was telling me she was at Kmart some time ago now with all their trendy slogan t-shirts, looking for a t-shirt for her daughter. 
And that one was cool. That one was cool. And then she looked at this next one and she thought, looking sideways, and she said, I could be wrong. I reckon that's satanic symbolism. So she took a photo. She didn't buy it. She took a photo, went home, did her research, and indeed it was a satanic symbol on a shirt. She messaged Kmart, who couldn't care less, mind you, about what she thought. But then she did say, I won't be buying anything from you. If that's what you're going to be promoting and selling, I'm done. And I thought, what an incredible, you know, stand to make, to actually contact them and say, that's not okay. But we see it more and more and more. When we look around the place, you'll see these things. When you, when you start to become attuned to it, you'll think, wow, is this, is this for real? And the truth is, our enemy is the master of deception. And you may or may not be wearing something that you have no idea what you're wearing. And you may not be wearing it on purpose, hoping for something to happen. But what you are doing is inviting satanic behavior into your life. You've got to be really, really careful. In everything we do, church, we should be seeking him first. Now, God says he supplies all our needs. We don't need to be looking left and right. We don't need to be looking to a rock. You don't need to be looking to a whole bunch of sticks that we join together and have smoke ceremonies. We don't need to be doing that. The Bible says it was for freedom that we were set free. We don't need rituals. We don't need to do these things to prove or to cleanse or anything like that. The only thing, and I wouldn't even call it a ritual, I would call it a practice or a routine that you build into your life is communion. And we look at this and we say, Jesus, wow, I am reminded of who I am, a sinner, a sinner. The only difference between me and somebody walking past the church this morning is I've been saved by grace. And the thing is, I can't get upset with people. Dion reminded me again this morning, I've been a little bit annoyed with some people this week with regards to what they've posted about Roe versus Wade in America. And Dion said, Lisa, you've had that revelation. They've not. And so the Bible does say to us that our behavior and the things that we do are like foolishness to the world. They haven't had the revelation. So next time you're wondering, is something good for me? Is it beneficial for me? Don't consult the world. Don't consult Google. Consult a solid Christian leader. Read your Bible, pray about it and say, God, is this for me or is it not? And be open enough in your spirit to say, okay, God, okay, maybe that means I have to change something about my life. But I think as all of us, as God seems to be taking the church on this journey of making us more like him in that purity, we will have to start making some more decisions. We will, as I said to my prayer group this week, uh, for those of you that don't know why I keep talking about Instagram, I have a business that has an Instagram account. It's one of the main avenues of advertising. And there's a lot of businesses on there that I'm connected with because we're small businesses in the Wimra. But just this week... Well, the last two weeks, perhaps, I've seen a lot of things on there that I can't unsee. And I feel a real conviction in my spirit to put distance between myself and those people. And I guess my prayer or my struggle was saying, God, I don't, I don't want to alienate people. I don't want them to think I'm better than them. I don't, I don't want that. That's it's not what I want. I just... I can't keep seeing those things and not be affected by it. And my prayer group of girls, which is really good, said, you know, you will know. God will tell you. And if you really feel that sense to unfollow or to disconnect in some way, then you need to do it. And, And I have. And I'll tell you the truth, it actually feels really good to not be bombarded with people's opinions who obviously come from a secular mindset. And I've sensed personally in my life, uh, in our family and my business as well, that God seems to be doing this. uh, We're not better than anybody else, but there's this separation. You know, the Bible talks about narrow is the road for us. 
And I think sometimes as believers, that's the hard part because there's this fear of man. Like, what does man think? What will they think when I do that? But I've also got a big poster on my wall at home that says, well, I haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. And we don't fear man. We love God. And we look to God and we say, Lord, I'm just going to do what you want me to do. And hopefully in all of this, people will see God. They will see the goodness of God. They will see that people are making a stand for their behaviors that they honestly believe. And I think that's what it is for me, is that people actually need to see that you stand for what you believe in. And if you lose friends, so be it. I've got plenty of friends here, don't I, Tori? got lots of friends at church. I don't need to worry about the ones on Instagram. But, you know, maybe that's a word for somebody else this morning as well, this, this idea of the fear of man. The Bible says it ensnares us, and that's not good. We don't want that. So let's pray this morning. Let's close in prayer. We haven't gone too late. Is everyone still awake? We got online. Well, I can't see you. So if you were napping, I hope you had a good nap. But let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Jesus, that we can come on a Sunday and worship you, meet with one another. As the Bible says, you know that iron sharpens iron. God, I pray that we would be a church that is known for truth. That people would know it's a church that preaches truth. We don't water down messages. We don't remove so-called daggy aspects. But we preach the truth. God, I thank you that there is so much power in your name. And Lord, I just sense that you're taking your church on a journey of purification and many of us will go with you on that, Lord, but there'll be others who don't wish to because it's it's too hard, or they've only been sold the, the selfish millennial gospel message. Father, I pray for repentance, Lord, where we have given preference to the spirit of man over the spirit of God, where we've done what we think is better to please people than what pleases you. And you know, church, I feel in my heart of hearts that when people say, you know, there's miracles and revivals and all these things pouring out in other nations in the world. And why isn't that in Australia? And I truly believe in my heart of hearts. It's because we've built a generation of selfish Christians. People who are so obsessed with themselves, how they look, how they sound, how they act, what's in it for me. That we've almost forgotten about the Spirit of God. And I pray that we would repent for that collectively and say, God, if there's times, Lord, where that's been me, we repent before you now, Jesus. We want to be a church of truth where people can come and hear the life-changing Word of God, where we can hear what is good for us, where we can receive correction, where we can go in leaps and bounds forwards as we become the bride of Christ. We thank you, Jesus, that you are returning for a spotless bride. And we sense, God, that you are moving through your church right around the world. And you're removing impurities. You're removing these things. And God, my heart is that, my prayer is that you would take us back to a heart of worship. That, Lord, it would be all about you and not about us, God. We pray that you would forgive, you would just... Forgive us, Jesus, for where we have made it about ourselves, where we've magnified ourselves. Lord, we pray for this generation of people who have probably didn't grow up in church, but maybe they got saved or found Jesus in their late teens or young adult years, and maybe they haven't really had a true encounter with you. God, we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would reveal yourself to them, Jesus, in a powerful way, in an undeniable way. That, God, they wouldn't care about the length of the service or how things look or how things appear, but their heart would be to worship you, Jesus. God, we give you all the praise this morning. Father, we know that you are the chief cornerstone. God, we pray for our church this morning 
We pray for Wheatland District Church, Lord, for everyone who attends face-to-face, but the many who are also with us online. God, we pray that this church, God, this church would always be true to your word, would preach the gospel message. Lord, that we would preach forgiveness. God, that we would preach repentance. God, that we would preach the narrow road. So that one day, God, we too will be joined by a great cloud of witnesses and cheering each other on. Lord, we thank you for our, the youngest in our church right through to the oldest. We thank you that you've called us all as a family of believers, that we can spur each other on, we can encourage each other. And God, that you would give us the courage to speak out when maybe we feel people are dabbling in things they shouldn't be, doing things they shouldn't be, to have the courage and say, hey, hey, where's that in the Word of God? Where is that? Knowing that, Lord, we're coming from a place of purity and we just want what's best. We thank you, Lord, that iron sharpens iron and we really pray that we would be a sharp, switched on church. Lord, we give you all the praise this morning. We give you all the glory this morning. And everyone who agrees said? Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. We pray you have a great afternoon with your families. I have a baby up the back to meet, which is very exciting. And I I hope everyone doesn't like jump on you because I'm coming first to meet the baby, obviously. But um, should we do coffees down, do you reckon? Or Huh? Oh, yeah, we'll do that. Frank, do you want a coffee or nah? Oh, you do? You do, Frank? Oh, you do? All right, well, the coffee machine is on. Oh, yes, before I forget, before I forget and get in trouble from the board, um, we do have to take up our offering. Um, oh, Frank, I see that hand. Would you like to do it? Or oh, Ian could. Ian looks enthused. Either way, so I can take it up for us. Uh, but tonight, I forgot to mention this again. We are continuing our Sunday night all-in Zoom call sessions. And tonight we have Pastor Andrew Cartledge joining us. Pastor Andrew is the senior pastor at Harvest Church in Horsham. and has been there for a number of years and has wanted to preach for us for so long. But it doesn't work because we have the exact same service time and he can't be in two places at once. So it just works and he's going to be with us tonight. So 7 p.m. on the Zoom call instead of our usual prayer meeting tomorrow night. So 7 p.m. tonight. If you didn't get the link, please let me know and I'll make sure you get it. Otherwise, give with joy in your heart. Hey, Ian, we'll make you a coffee. We'll meet some babies and we're going to rub shoulders with one another because iron sharpens iron. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great week. And thanks for tuning in online.